Welcome to Helen Sawson, my own little piece of heaven in Sweden. Um, I asked a question um, on my Twitter feed earlier. Uh, why does Theresa May s lie so much? Um, Theresa May's Twitter feed comes into mine and um, I mean it's interesting to see what she has to say. Um, perhaps it's more interesting to consider the things that she doesn't say. I mean, one can lie by omission uh, as well as by commission. Um, but uh, I did this blog, which I linked to, uh, and um, it's on the nature of totalitarianism, and uh, it was a a um, post which I did on Caitlin Johnson's um, Medium account uh, regarding um, conspiracies, fake news, uh, you know, the idea of propaganda, why it works, why people, uh, you know, why the lies seem to work. And um, that post to uh, Caitlin had this quote from Hannah Arendt, the uh, mid-20th century philosopher, um, and I had been reading a collection of Hannah Arendt's essays uh, on the nature of totalitarianism, and um, here's the quote. The lies of totalitarian movements, invented for the moment, as well as the forgeries committed by totalitarian regimes, are secondary to this fundamental attitude that excludes the very distinction between truth and falsehood. It is for this end, that is, for the consistency of a lying world order, rather than for the sake of power or any other humanly understandable sinfulness, that totalitarianism requires total domination and global rule, and is prepared to commit crimes which are unprecedented in the long and sinful history of mankind. Um, there's a link in that blog to um, that collection of essays, so you can read them online. Um, and I go on then to say, uh, if one then throws in Arendt's observations on the importance of separation of powers in functioning states and the failure of the fourth estate, one gets to a dystopian Rovian turn, a peculiar anti-historicity where facts and reasons become the enemy of raw power. Um, all the while the masses, uh, like Nero fiddle, whilst Rome burns. Uh, and that links to another blog which I updated yesterday in light of the polling for the local elections. Um, but what I also said to Caitlin uh, I drew attention to uh, my series of poems um, which were or are introduced by my essay on the Iron Law of Oligarchy um, and then there are three poems which I've written. Um, one of them is called uh, uh, Usury, Hell's Fuel Man's Oppressor, the other one is uh, Bourgeois Resolution and the final one is Globalisation and Entangled. Um, that trilogy and that essay form the basis of um, the novel which I'm in the middle of writing at the moment uh, which is called Conquest of Doe. Now I wanted to do a reading of um, hell's uh, of, of, of usury, hell's fuel, man's oppressor, um, and uh, it was the first of the trilogy which I wrote, and which um, is still in the top ten of blogs that I've done. Um, the number of views or reads of the poem uh, are actually. Uh, 1520 at this point and it was published on the 25th of February 2016 on my blog. It's also available 
uh, on Lulu, the self-publishing site, and Amazon in um, a collection of poems called Philosoetry, which was reviewed on the Real Poetry uh, website uh, by another poet, um, and um, it was introduced kindly by David Malone of the Gollum 15 blog. Now, um, so here we go. I, I, I just wanted to read this poem, um, the reading which is uh, already on the uh, website. Um, it was sort of hastily done and the recording isn't so great. Um, this webcam, you know, does give, give a reasonable sound, I guess. Uh, and so, without further ado, um, how much honesty can there be in the world? Hell's usury. Oh, here we go. I, uh, let's let's start that again. I, there's a mistake in the title on the blog, but it's uh, usury, hell's fuel, man's oppressor. Dear reader, we meet our economy in its repose. We see its citizens and see their polity. One community under usury, a life under the liberty of the yoke, a country estate. Around a fireside after a day of work and sport, a father and two sons talk and reflect, a loved first son speaks. Tell me this, wise father, how much money is there in the world? Tell me where it comes from and where it goes to die. Son, I cannot answer your questions, for truly I do not believe that any man has the answers. Men have pursued money and in the pursuit lost sight of the prey. For it seems that one man's pursuit seems frustrated in the victory and another's object of pursuit is only real during the chase. Father, I am your second son. I also wonder, as my elder brother does, what is the meaning of money? Should I lay suit for it and pay its high price when we have all that we want and need here on your estates? Dear second son, we have our life and family here and we have the extra hands and mouths that all help to feed ourselves and each other. In these treasures we have no need of money. Others have been divorced from their estates and live in cities. This is where we send our surpluses. Our neighbours also help to feed the cities. The king asks us that we accept tokens from the citizens in return. Our tokens buy the favours of the king and pay the dues he calls taxes. In this we may as well act willingly, as in truth we have no choice. The Baker's Kitchen Table Around a fireside, an artisan baker sits with his two daughters after a long day. First daughter, tell me this, wise father, how much money is there in the world? And how do customers who buy our bread get their money? What of citizens without a token for a loaf? Father baker, the money we are paid is a token from the government treasury with authority from the king. These are the same tokens with which we buy our flour from the estates and our firewood for the oven. Second daughter. Father, this bakery has been with the family for generations. How would a new oven and a new shop be possible for the orphan son of the bakery that burnt in the other village, destroying the family and the shop? Somehow the young boy survived. Now he starts from nothing. How can he hope to provide his needs in the future? Father Baker, that poor boy will be alone with nothing in the world, a sad case and a story told a thousand times, no one to teach his trade to him and no family business left to carry on, no plot of land from which to raise sustenance and a surplus to trade. In the soldier's house, a soldier sits alone, he is of high rank and of proud deportment, he is served by his batman. Both bachelors and both veterans of many campaigns, the soldier has returned from the palace where he has received another decoration. The medal and the prize are being admired by the Batman. Batman. 
in general, the King is very grateful for our campaign abroad this year. A medal of solid gold, encrusted with valuable jewels, and many tokens in the prize. Enough to buy all the bread and all the bakeries in the kingdom. General. Yes, the King is pleased. His campaigns refurnish the treasury to repay the usurers his international debts and interest. In the banker's house. The banker sits in luxury, footmen in attendance, and wife and mother seated in equal pomp and finery. Business is being discussed. Wife. Tell me, dear, didn't the king look unwell at the ceremony this afternoon? Mother, we all, he always was a nervous boy. When your father and I used to attend the king, old king's ceremonies, the young prince, as he was then, never seemed as right. Why? Mother-in-law, when you and father-in-law knew the old king, and we were not as rich as we are now, and now my husband has prospered as the new king's ambitions have overstretched his purse, and I wondered if my banker husband had such concerns. Banker. My father did much service to the old king. The new king does much service for us now in return. Wife. Tell me, my banker husband, where did your father and his father's father find the wit to have the king grant you privilege to create the tokens? How many of them do you have? Where were they found? Banker. It's a long story. Let us take our leisure in the drawing room, that I might smoke and have a brandy. My great-great-grandfather sailed away to Xanadu. The year was 1249, and the captain on board ship was Marco Polo. We lived in Venice, where Marco Polo returned. He told of Kublai Khan's riches. Khan's riches flowed from a strange alchemy, money from trees, bark from mulberries, denominated in sizes, under the seal of the Khan. Feign deafness to the Khan's bark on pain of death. They serve as good as gold, a fraction of the weight. All foreign merchants sell to Khan's monopoly. The merchants trade with paper in the kingdom. Such power as this, with a twist of usury, we innovate Marco Polo's discovery creating the money, but not the means to meet the usury, all wealth guaranteed to flow back to the issuer. Money newly grown on trees, with usury sportingly absent, surely a creature whose bark is not worse than its bite. Kings now borrowed for rivals to smite, bankers became emperors, usury were the real fangs. In the priest's house. The priest sits at high table with the other clergy of the court. Deacon to the priest. Holy Father, the king seemed distracted today. The general seemed well rewarded from the latest campaign. How, though, do we reconcile the king's distraction with the claimed success? Parish priest. Yes, Holy Father, an orphan child in my parish will be without hopes of starting afresh without usurious debt. How are the people to bear the costs? The bounties of their labours are ever increasing, and yet, for want of money, there is no traffic in the market square. Yet people are cold and hungry in the workhouses. The Holy Father. The King is seduced. My office is no longer to hear confessions and give guidance. But we are grew rich in the indulgences we must prefer on our monarch and his aid, the banker. For usury makes a gain out of money itself, not used merely for exchange, but increasing at interest. A price paid for nothing, exchanged for something. The price of the receipt eats the value of the thing exchanged. In the court, a usurer demands his deserts. When Shylock petitions the Duke, can he exact a pound of flesh and spill no blood? The judge must honour the contract. How many others does the forfeiture doom? Neither brassy bosoms, rough hearts of flint, nor stubborn Turks and Tartars feel obliged to temper the harshness of usury or forfeiture when the price cannot be met. The quality of mercy is most definitely strained. It flattens crops like hail. Truly only the usurer is twice blessed. 
and the throned monarch is unthroned. Usury, the usurer's crown of gold, our crown remains of thorns. New suitors of title, masters of the universe, not Belmont's fair Porsche sought, Porsches and financial instruments of many more horsepower, talk of twisted vigour. No longer metaphors of gold for gaining man's desire, or of silver and its just deserts, always lead and usurious alchemy, hearts now made of stone. Failed suit of Morocco, return and count revenues from the souks. Failed suit of Aragon, beware robbers from Flanders with heavy deniers, stockinged masks. Seek inside your own Bassanio, rejecting usury's gold, hard food of Midas. Tween man and man, no usury, plain lead and recognise money's deceit. As Portia's counterfeit redeemed in marriage, so too should all value tokens declare the facsimile of exchange they truly be, money a true handshake in honour alone. The courtiers of the exchequer address the king. We economists, beholden as we are to the princes of usury, and as the false prophets of usury, we fit the horse foot to the shoe that suits us best. It matters not that the horse becomes lame unless furlongs are ploughed, as we deny the poison in our own usurious medium. We also deny that what ills our patients could be from any panacea concocted in our own alchemist's crucible. Our unit of account, that is to say, this store of value, not to leave unsaid this medium of exchange. Ah, Scarlet Pimpernel, which no one quite pins down, we say we give you something always the same, fungible with each the other, the one whole held in safe keeping, returned, what we call these claims, or definitions of claims, these bundles of demands, is money. Insinuated into civil intercourse, ubiquitous in the machinery of community, deployed as a lever and pulley in affairs of state, a measure of nothing, conjured to divine what's important. Counsel for the people charge usury of its crimes. This barren abstract that claims fruit, this heavy invisible burden, a yoke fashioned in language, felt but never seen, Inflicting scars as deep as any lash, claiming lives as real as any cannon, this nightmare device of imagination. Who are the slayers of this mythical dragon? Cold ridge saw beauty in nature, where sweet amaranths bloom, and Shakespeare compared his summer's day. What of this hamless ghost of a spectre? Something is rotten in the Danegeld. Many more promises are written than can be kept. So much nectar strained from thin broth. Which bargains can be made? When the music stops and the dancers sit down, chairs are our metaphor for the real. Always too few. Rascals become clothed in robes, and honesty is reduced to rags. Elizabeth Lease had a purchase on truth. When people starve, how can overproduction stand charged? It is money promises kept short in supply that cause starvation. The consumption in the lungs of the community is the usurer's confection. A counterfeit noble laureate, there's an irony, denies that in money there can be a place that Gertrude Stein called there. Home once, but no longer there, there in Oakland, a precursor to some subprime heritage. A speaker of truth to power could follow Pauli. Das ist nicht nur nicht richtig, es ist nicht einmal falsch. Not even wrong, 
not even there, all counterfeit yet. To counterfeit the counterfeit? A crime. What of the shepherd of this unruly nothing? Where will they pen and fence this pack of wolves? Will they dress this pack of cards in sheep's clothing, limit the herd and need for golden standards? Prudence of sound money and even sound usury, fix the price and patronise those who will honour the thievery, a mechanism to harmonise silent ballant boxes. A gentleman from Belgium would compliment his single currency, unruled and unruly sets a course for austerity on a continent many times at war, a fight of eleven rounds. Spread like cancer through the development of continents, enabling the killing called wars that increase the debt and centralise the money power. Quigley showed the tragedy, little hope it seemed, blind faith in capitalism's harlot, that Babylonian whore. At first a mere money trick for ragged, trousered philanthropy, with usury, take away what's not even yet been paid. Ruskin would see wealth as that which is valuable in the hands of the valiant, real goods sustained and wealth suckers. Usurious money is but an unmade claim, and worse, no banker has earned that newly minted note that hangs discordant in the air as apt to rob as to pay. How obscure this obscurant cult of mammon, what smoke-screened hall of mirrors, how obese and gluttonous the leviathan of usury, Austerity for the likes of you and I, more banqueting and evacuated vomit spews from the sceptred top table, corrupt in patronage and jealousy of power, overstuffed with greed and thirsty for more. How mean the jealousy of greed grows, as more wants more and demands all. The truly poor are those who desire much, oppressive wealth, no longer is, it only has. Usury consumes the userer, no self, just an exponential nothing, growing ever more grotesque in a shadow of what never was and never could be. A doom-laden ring of the Nibelungs, slain by Teutonic nobles and routed by heroic Norsemen. The paper money shrouds the rock of Prometheus, and still he forgets in whose promises the usurer's truck. A semiotic turn, Wenzel's genuinely fate. A language of abstract form commemorates brotherhood. Van Meegren's suffer at Amanuus implies Vermeer's intention for experts to divine. A counterfeit of that which never had been claimed as real and must be from the brush of the master, a looting tyranny, coveting the genuine fakery like so much gold, pulled from the mouths of corpses, like so many rabbits out of so many hats, and the goldfish does not know the water it swims in until the surface is broken. The beauty of dying lilies, the artist petrifies the fleeting moment, and time is solidified. A promise solidified in time, measured in life, a non-existence. Celebrate Les Miserables of L'Argent. Hugo, Zola and Proudhon scream. A promise wrapped in a lie, claiming existence where no air remains to breathe or food to sustain. Asking everything, forgiving nothing. A mountbank by nature, a swindle made official by the state to enslave the masses and keep them in want. Concluding prayer. A central lack of fibre, either moral or physical, around which myths of debt are spun, as spiders spin webs and weavers warp cloth. Spartan ethers of prudence pass judgment on all and stand above and astride the law, dispensing injustice and taking clothes off the backs of the freezing and food out of the mouths of the hungry, passing judgment 
on those who perform real work, asking always for more and demanding to pay less. So draw the bow of truth with intentness in the eye. Seek out the irreducible posits, the epistemological gods of Homer. If there be one free miracle, let the ephors explain the rest. What is this power of usury? Where did this power come from? Who is it exercised for? And to whom do you ephors of usury answer to? And now let me ask, how do we take this power away? Only then we shall see good faith and brotherhood restored to the commons.